be released from all that is wrong. Crave that which is pure, so that you may grow in your salvation as you come to Christ the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen and precious to God. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now God's mercy is yours. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. I trust in you, Lord. I declare that you are my God. My times are in your hands. Let your face shine upon me. Save me in your unfailing love. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know the Father as well. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? even after I have been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The words I say to you I do not speak on my own authority, rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Once again, we, we find ourselves this Sunday invited to reflect on some of the words of Jesus from before his death and resurrection. But again, I want to invite you to approach our gospel reading from the perspective of those first disciples who spent the weeks after the events that we remember at Easter, largely in lockdown, huddled together, very much in fear of the outside world, trying to make sense of things, trying to make sense of God, trying to make sense of Jesus, trying to make sense of their own feelings and, and particularly some of the conflicting narratives that would have inevitably gone around in their heads and again we can recognize how their experience is not that dissimilar to the one that many of us are going through at the moment. They were beginning to connect the person of Jesus with the God that they'd learned about from childhood but then having to get their heads around the, those great words in the Psalms like the ones that we read earlier in our service you're my rock and my fortress you're my refuge and deliverer but then reconciling them with this Jesus who washed their feet, who'd allowed himself to be arrested, who instead of calling down fire from heaven on his enemies, stands silent in the face of his accusers. He allows himself to be crucified and then 
even after rising from the dead. He doesn't go parading himself around the streets or stirring up the crowds to seek revenge, but rather he just quietly appears to his disciples, quietly assures them of his peace and his presence. This was a very different Messiah from the one that they would have brought, been brought up to believe in. But if Jesus really was God, which they were increasingly coming to recognise and to believe, then their whole understanding of who God was needed to be recalibrated. You may remember on the road to Emmaus, the, the conversation began with this almost protest. We thought he'd be the one who redeemed Israel. We thought he'd be the one who'd restore our fortunes and, and make us great again. That was what they'd always expected from God's Messiah. And that idea never really left those first disciples in those early weeks. On the day that Jesus ascended into heaven, the book of Acts records almost with a sense of exasperation that they still ask Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And I wonder how much of that might resonate with our own experience. You know, we'll all have our own different understandings of God. And I wonder how often it's those understandings of God that kind of dictate what we do and, and what we say and what we think. You know, I'm fascinated when I read Facebook posts and blogs by different Christian individuals and groups speculating on, on what this coronavirus tells us about God, about God's will, about God's judgment. And dare I say that, that most of them probably say more about the people that are writing them than they do about God. We can't shape God by our own expectations. We're invited to let our understanding of God be shaped by the person of Jesus. And as those disciples began to put together this picture of Jesus' identity, and to recognise that he was indeed, as the Gospel of John contends from the outset, God made flesh. They had to realise that this did not mean trying to squeeze Jesus into the mould of their own ideas about God. But they had to re-understand God in the light of, of what Jesus did and what Jesus said, in the light of, of who Jesus was. And I believe that we're called to do exactly the same. Of course, the present circumstances are causing us to ask questions about who God is and what God is like for a whole load of reasons. For many of us, we expressed our Christian identity by participating in a series of activities, by fulfilling certain tasks. And suddenly we're either no longer doing that or we're having to do it in a different way. And that change of routine will make us ask questions about God. And many of us have simply got more time on our hands and time to invest in reflecting on our faith, the people we are. And we're discovering God's presence in new ways and perhaps, dare I say, noticing God's presence in places where we were too preoccupied to notice God before. And then, of course, there is the reality of COVID-19 and all the sadness and the fear and the anguish that's being generated by that. We are a troubled people and it was to a very troubled and concerned group of disciples that, that Jesus spoke on the night before he died. Jesus spoke those words that we read earlier in our gospel reading. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus says, which suggests to me that the atmosphere in the room that evening was probably very troubled and with good reason because there were some very sinister forces at work, some very sinister forces surrounding them. But it's in this moment that Jesus again asserts his identity. There's this rather tense, awkward conversation led from what we can see by Philip and Thomas. You know, we don't know where you're going. Just tell us where you're going. Let us see the Father. If you just show us God, they say. And Jesus responds with this profound declaration. God is in the room with you. I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you follow me, you will be led to the Father. 
the problem is that, that God was staring them in the face. But they wanted God to be something other than who God was. Don't let your hearts be troubled, says Jesus. Believe. Believe in me. Believe in who I am. And I think it would be good for us to pause and to just recognise that response. The disciples had every reason to be troubled. They weren't stupid. They could see what was happening. In the previous narratives of the Gospel, John tells us again and again that as Jesus raised the dead, brought healing, gained popularity with the crowds, wrecked the temple marketplace, spoke out against the powers that be, the powers that be were getting more and more agitated. Meetings were taking place, antagonists were being sent to ask awkward questions, to try and trip Jesus up, to try and get him to say something that would incriminate him. And you can feel the tension mounting, you can feel the inevitable lurking as the Gospel writer tells us the story. And this, this was their Passover meal. This was their equivalent of our Christmas dinner. And instead of the atmosphere being all party poppers and stories from Grandad, it was tense, it was awkward, it was troubled. And I sense that in that moment, in, in their troubling of their hearts, what the disciples were desperate to hear Jesus say was, don't let your hearts be troubled, I'll sort it all out. Don't let your hearts be troubled, God will come to our rescue. But that's not what Jesus said. What Jesus said is, believe believe in me you know that narrative of don't be troubled we'll sort it all out is one that we love to this very day how many times have you watched an action movie or a drama and the hero and their companion seem to be stuck in an impossible situation but you know they're going to be rescued usually because there's someone with a gun in their hand who could just shoot them and put an end to them but no they always invent some elaborate time consuming means of putting them to death and it looks as though their end is nigh but you know why it's taking so long because at the 11th hour in come the rescuers the hero manages to break free of their bonds and they're all saved and i just wonder whether we've become so hooked on narratives like that that we unconsciously can attach the same thinking to our faith. God will sort everything out. God will make the nasty things go away. God will always come to our rescue. But Jesus does not say, let not your hearts be troubled, I'll make it all go away. Let not your hearts be troubled, I'll deal with the problem. Jesus says, believe. We want to know where you're going, says Thomas. Oh, no, you don't, says Jesus. Not, not quite in those words, but Jesus was absolutely clear in his own mind. The way to the Father was the way of the cross. Jesus did not offer them an 11th hour rescue package. What he offered them was a completely different way of seeing the events that would follow. He would be tried. And they would no doubt seethe inside as they listened to the trumped up evidence and misrepresentation of events that they'd been present at. He would have been beaten. And they would wince at the pain he would bear. He would be mocked and laughed at and they would feel ashamed at what they were witnessing. And he would be crucified and they would feel sick with grief and despair. And around the cross would be a whole crowd of witnesses. The soldiers and the execution party who would treat Jesus with complete indifference, just another troublemaker to be put to death. The rulers who would revel and gloat because they'd succeeded in their intent. intent. The passers-by who would mock and laugh and others who'd followed Jesus would have just wallowed in despair. But Jesus invited those in the upper room not to avoid these events, not to look the other way, but to believe, to believe in who Jesus was, to believe that he truly was the way to the Father. And yes, what they were going to witness bore no resemblance to what they expected of their Messiah, but they had to believe that he was the Messiah. What would happen was not what should happen if a loving creator became human and made his dwelling among humanity. But they were called to believe that that's who Jesus was. 
and the journey ahead would be horrific and traumatic and laden with grief and suffering but they needed to believe that this was the way to the father and i think there's much for us to draw from that we are bombarded at the moment with narratives within our Christian networks and in wider society. People want answers. People want to know where we're going. People want to know whose fault this is. People want to know when it will all be over. And it's easy for us to pick up those narratives and make these the basis of our own conversations with God. But Jesus' response is find relief from your trouble by believing in who I am. And don't let circumstances, your own struggles, your own fear, your own confusion, change your perception of who I am. Believe in me for who I am. Believe in me because I am the way, the truth and the life. Not, what, be, not because of what might or might not happen. And why can we believe? Why should we believe? Because Jesus says, in my Father's house, are many rooms. You belong in my father's house. Now this is an interesting phrase and perhaps one that is particularly poignant for us at the moment. God's house is something many of us tend to attach as a description to our church buildings. I remember when I was a kid this was particularly impressed on me if I was caught something doing doing something that I shouldn't be doing like kicking a football around or playing pop music. My dad or my granddad would say to me this is the Lord's house and so yeah right now my father's house is locked and closed until further notice but it's an interesting phrase because just a few days earlier, Jesus had used that phrase when he had wrecked the marketplace in the temple courtyard. My father's house, he said, should be a house of prayer for all nations. And if you were with us last week, you may remember those final words of the 23rd Psalm. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And now Jesus says, don't be troubled. Believe in me. Believe that there are many rooms in my father's house and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And so Jesus lifts our sights away from a physical building to an eternal reality. Now, that doesn't mean that our buildings aren't important. If buildings weren't important, Jesus wouldn't have made such a fuss in the temple. But it seems to me that what Jesus is asking us is is what is this building saying what is it saying when it's supposed to be a place where everyone can encounter god and instead it's become a marketplace for religious enthusiasts jesus speaks of his father's house to help us think beyond our buildings to who we are and i think that offers some really interesting pointers for the present times what do our buildings represent they're only God's house because we are God's house you know you might remember that the word house has two distinct meanings if you think back to the narratives of the nativity we read that Joseph went to Bethlehem because he was of the house of David that was the community he belonged to. And we, we still use the word house in that way today, particularly if we're talking about some of the great names in fashion. We often speak of them as being a house. Uh, that's how we describe their, their own brand and their own style. It's the house of such and such. And, and in the letter of Peter, this is very much in mind when all of these images come together. As you come to him, the living stone, he says, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. In scripture, it says, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone and of course Peter is referring here to Jesus himself to us as God's house built around the cornerstone of Jesus the house that Peter has in mind is very much a community a household which taking the words of Jesus on Palm Sunday is called to be a household of welcome 
a prayerful community for people from everywhere. So there are three very clear images of my father's house. One is a physical space, a place of gathering and welcome. One is a community, a people founded on Jesus, being shaped by God's spirit and being built into a temple. And the other is an eternal dwelling. I go there to prepare a place for you, says Jesus. And as we hold these three images in our minds, I sense that there's a huge encouragement in that, but also a challenge. Let's start with the encouragement. Our physical buildings are closed. We cannot go to the house of the Lord in, in the way that we once used to, but they are only a representation of a far more profound reality that can never be taken from us. We belong to God's family. Whether or not we can gather in the physical spaces or follow the usual routines that we've become used to, we belong to God's family. So while our buildings may be closed, when we remind ourselves of what it fully means to be in God's house, God's house is well and truly open for business. And we have a dwelling place in eternity that will outlast any earthly building. And that cannot be threatened by any of the things that concern us at the moment. And please, if you're watching this and you're not a regular at one of our churches, remember these words of Jesus. This is a house that has plenty of room, plenty of room for everyone. And Jesus got angry, not when the wrong people turned up there, but when religious people got in the way with all their paraphernalia and market stalls. So believe me, there is a place of welcome in God's house for you, in God's eternal house, in God's eternal community. Believe. That's what Jesus invites us to do. Believe in God. Believe in Jesus. Believe that the road we travel will lead us to the Father, even if the journey is really tough. It was for Jesus. It was for his followers, but it led to an eternal dwelling place where there was plenty of room. So let's be encouraged. But let's also be challenged. You know, we can draw strength at the moment from recognising that there is so much more to being in God's community than keeping a building open. But have we always reflected that in how we go about things? Have we always put the same amount of effort into building and maintaining a spiritual community, that, that temple of living stones, as Peter puts it, as we do into our buildings? Have we made sure that our buildings really are houses of prayer in which everyone feels welcome and comfortable? And are we as committed to opening the doors for people to that eternal home, that house of many rooms, as Jesus describes it? You know, we've been reminded in recent days that we are about so much more than buildings. So let's not forget that as we move forward. Let's make sure that we keep that in our sights and don't forget the commission of Jesus to put it into the sights of others too. So yeah, these are troubling times and we can rightly draw great strength from the words of Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. But let's remember too that he offers that hope not by promising that the things that concern us will go away, not by avoiding the harsh realities that lay in store for him and his followers, but by believing. Believing in who Jesus is, believing that he is the way to the Father, and believing that in God's eternal household there are plenty of rooms, and that he goes on ahead of us to prepare our place in God's eternity. So yes, these are troubling times, but so much of the narrative of God's word was worked out in troubling times and troubling circumstances. And Jesus said what he said in the very heart of some of the most troubling circumstances that we could ever imagine. Don't be troubled, he said. Believe. Don't be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. 
believe in my father's house. Mm -hmm.